Hello, everyone. Can, is this my con? Can you all hear me? No, I don't think they can hear me. Hello, hello. No, can you hear me? Yeah, can, we, can you hear me at the back? Can you pretend to hear me at least? <laughs> It's like my dad, my mom always says, oh, he's got such selective hearing. Um, I think you can hear me. All right. Uh, welcome uh, to the first ever Science in the Six event, and we're going to celebrate UHN researchers and their research tonight. My name is Mary Ito. I'm a broadcast journalist with CBC Radio, and uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank One person clapping. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, just before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land that we are meeting on. It is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So tonight, you will hear from some of UHN's uh, top up-and-coming scientists about their groundbreaking work, which uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing about. I know that some of your colleagues are here as well, and we've got probably family and relatives, and I think our youngest scientist, a baby who's 18 months, is here, Shane's daughter. Um, I know personally that many people have a great thirst for knowledge. Uh, you just have to look at continuing education and online learning, public lectures, learning conferences. The world is moving at an incredibly fast pace and people want to know what's ahead. This year marks, as many of you heard, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Um, and of course, that's one of humankind's greatest achievements. But what uh, was really interesting when I was hearing about all the celebrations that happened earlier is that your cell phone, that small phone that fits in your hand, has a hundred thousand times more processing power and over a million times more memory than the computer that was on the Apollo mission. So to think in you know, just those 50 years we have gone that far, um, we need to keep up with research, all of us. So though we are not sending anyone to uh, the moon or even Mars tonight, uh, the goal of this evening is to bring science to you, to get you excited about it, and to help you understand the impact that it will have on your lives. And also, of course, to introduce you to some of the people who are working on this game-changing research. And their names will undoubtedly become familiar to all of us in the future. I want to turn your attention right now to the video monitors, and this is just a taste of what you'll be seeing this evening. Science isn't just microscopes and neurons and bacteria. It's a way of asking questions. We are training the system to find a new path between the muscle and the brain. Everyone has some connection to cancer. We need to find a way that we can prolong their life and give them hope. Studying regeneration or using cells to fix broken hearts, that is something very new. The brain is vast, the brain is complex. You want to kind of crack that code. So what if that was a pandemic and the virus spreads really fast? We are predicting the future. I was always interested in robotics. I love using technology to improve someone's experience. Science is curiosity, and science is wanting to know more about the world. It's fun. <laughs> hey, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> okay, just before we um, get started with our researchers, uh, just a few quick things to note. Uh, we are live streaming tonight, so if anyone could not make it, and you want to let them know, please do that. They can go to UHN's Twitter account, and you can click on the link to watch remotely. Also, uh, this is a phone-friendly event. However, please make sure the volume is turned down on your phone. But also, feel free, if you want to take photos, you can do that during the talks. You can also post on social media. The hashtag is Science in the Six, and the six is the six number, IX. Uh, and lastly, if you have any questions for our scientists, there won't be any uh, time during the talks themselves, but you can speak to each of them at the end. Uh, and if you'd like to reach out and connect with any of the speakers uh, at a later date, then you can find contact information for UHN Public Affairs, and it's at the back of the brochure that we handed out. Right now, I would like to call up Dr. Kevin Smith, who is president and CEO of UHN. He'd like to say a few words about our keynote, and he's a really fun guy. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mary. Uh, first, please join me in thanking Mary for being with us here tonight. It's great. <laughs> Uh, I also want to thank uh, so many family members of the scientists who here, are here tonight. You share in their discoveries, and science is not an easy discipline, so thank you not only to the scientists, but all of those family members who support you. We are incredibly grateful for the opportunity to tell you about our research program at University Health Network. UHN is Canada's largest research hospital with a proud history of discovery and many world firsts. The first use of clinical insulin going back to 1922, you'll know that's often referred to as Canada's gift to the world. The identification of the T cell receptor, the holy grail of immunology in 1984, and more recently, combined liquid biopsy, epigenetics, and machine learning to develop a simple blood test, one that has the, a huge potential for en enabling the earlier detection of cancers. These are a few of the highlights from what we've achieved in our laboratories and clinical environments so far. But tonight's event is bringing science out of the lab and into the community where it's truly needed. Because it's not enough for us to list past accomplishments. We want to tell you about how our research is indeed changing our lives and changing our future. Healthcare is undoubtedly facing a fa challenging time. You all see the media. We know that we're struggling a bit with capacity and access and that ever elusive blend of cost, quality, and accessibility. But in my opinion, it will be research that will help us solve these bigger challenges. We are as a society, luckily, living longer thanks to research, but also suffering from diseases and illnesses that may affect our quality of life with longer life. Loneliness is a healthcare epidemic at the moment, and never before have the broader determinants of health been more obviously at the root of health and well being of Canadians. At the same time, we're in an incredible moment of opportunity. The advancement of technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning is allowing us new insights into the human body and the human condition. It's helping us to find new ways of predicting disease earlier personalizing those treatments for disease, and ultimately preventing disease from occurring at all. It's certainly not always easy and not always glamorous to be a researcher, although you'd never know it looking at this group in front of me. <laughs> there are many long days and nights in the lab and on the ward or in the home, in front of patients, petri dishes, and beyond. It's painstaking and often frustrating work. And remember, the first rule of science is the null hypothesis hypothesis, proving it doesn't work. It's also hugely rewarding, and I know you're going to hear and see that from these remarkable scientists. They have an intrinsic love of science and a passion for answering important questions. Sometimes they might seem obscure questions, but it's only in retrospect that we often discover, discover that these are life-changing questions. Tonight is a unique opportunity to introduce you to the next generation of UHN scientists dedicated to truly creating a healthier world. Our speakers tonight are working on game-changing research and technology that one day will help eliminate cancer, will assist people with spinal cord injuries to achieve a greater level of independence and mobility, and allow those with neurological illness to live symptom-free. These scientists are our future, and their work will impact the future of Canada. To find new treatments, we need to make discoveries. There is simply no other option, and it's people just like these that will make that happen. The science you'll hear about tonight also has the power and potential to evolve Canada's new knowledge-based economy. Balancing changes in our industrial and manufacturing economy, our future economy will be built on highly qualified personnel and translating scientific funding into benefits that could be commercialized, thereby creating new jobs and new opportunities for Canada and Canadians. Tonight's showcase is meant to bring this research out of our labs and at this stage to you. This is only a taste. We have so much more to share and look forward to doing so in the future. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's keynote speaker, Andre Picard. Andre, as all of you know, is an award-winning journalist with The Globe and Mail the author of five best-selling books, including Matters of Life and Death, Public Health Issues in Canada, and a past winner of the prestigious Michener Award for Meritorious Public Service in Journalism. 
With an election around the corner, it is especially timely to hear Andre's perspective on the role of science in society today. Please join me in welcoming Andre Picard. Well, thank you for that very uh, kind introduction. So in the short time I have tonight, I want to do two things. I want to reflect a bit on the state of uh, science and healthcare in Canada today, as you heard, and I want to discuss how we can better communicate uh, health and science in the era of Twitter and fake news. And you're going to see some great communicators tonight uh, after I'm done, after the old guy gets out of the way. So let me start with science and specifically research funding, because we're a few days away from an election. So what, what's going on? Now, sadly, I have to tell you that none of the parties have really made any commitments to increase science funding. So I was going to be my whole speech, but I had nothing to say because they're not doing anything. So that, that's unfortunate. And it's particularly unfortunate because we had a great report a couple of years ago, the Naylor Report, the Canada's Fundamental Science Review, which really reminded us how grossly Canada underspends and how this is a mistake in a brain economy. Canada doesn't rank well globally in research or development funding. We're 20th in the OECD. Uh, the US, our neighbor, spends four times higher per capita on research than we do. And that's, I'm talking about public money, not private money. And our businesses, our private businesses in Canada are also laggards on R&D spending. In most OECD countries, business R&D spending makes up about 70% of total research spending. In Canada, it's only 40%. So this notion that all research funding problems can be solved by partnering with business, uh, unfortunately, that's a fantasy. Uh, Dr. Naylor said it well. He said, been there, tried that, let's move on. It has to be about the collectivity. It has to be all of us contributing to our own futures. Now, as you know, there are three major government bodies that provide funding for research in Canada. I'm not going to give their full names, I'll just give you their acronyms. So SSHRC, NSERC, CIHR, and there's a fourth uh, CFI. So one of the most important lessons tonight is if you want to be a researcher in Canada, you have to have an infinite capacity to retain acronyms, because <laughs> there's a lot of them. A lot of C, everything starts with a C in Canada. Now, the Naylor Report recommended that these four major bodies, funding bodies, be merged into a single one, and of course it has its own acronym, NACRI. And saying that, you know, our fundamental problem is that our research ecosystem is very poorly coordinated, much like our health system. So the big four science granting agencies receive about $3.5 billion in funding uh, last year, and the Naylor Report recommended that increase to $4.8 billion. So a big increase, but not unaffordable. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that none of the political parties had made any funding commitments to research, and that's unfortunate. But to be fair, I should mention that the Liberals, uh, during their last term, have increased the Tri-Council budget significantly, significantly by about 25%. So that's, that's notable, but that came after a very lean decade of the Harper years where essentially funding went down. So we've got a lot of catching up to do and we're not really doing it. Now I know here you have a particular uh, interest and specialization in neuroscience, so I should mention that uh, the Liberals also invested $40 million additional last year in Brain Canada. And that's a reminder that there are many other smaller agencies, aside from the big three or four, that do some interesting work. But again, there's probably some need for consolidation there. So in summary, what's going on in research? Well, business underinvests, and so does government. So what's left? Philanthropy. So Canadians give about $10 billion to charity each year. One of the books I wrote a few years back was about the state of charity in Canada. But that money, that's a significant amount, but it's spread out among 160,000 groups. So, you know, it's spread pre pretty thinly. Uh, we know, we don't know exactly how much of that money goes to research, but it's certainly less than half. Probably about the equivalent of what government spends. Uh, we do know that large philanthropic donations are important, but they tend to be directed at specific areas. Uh, donors like their names on buildings and they like to buy stuff. They don't necessarily like to pay wages and, and, and buy practical things that are needed day to day. So there are a lot of limitations to philanthropy. As I said, 
investment has to be a collective effort, which means we have to invest more tax dollars and be willing to do so. And that's why, in part, it's really important to get your research out there, to convince the public that it's important. So I think that first part of my talk was sufficiently depressing, so I'll move on. <laughs> Let's talk about healthcare a bit. So healthcare is of great interest to Canadians. Poll after poll says it's the number one issue that we care about in this country. But what do we hear about it on the election campaign? We hear actually very little. Uh, it wasn't even included as an area of discussion in the leaders' debates. We didn't have, an, we didn't have a section on healthcare, which Sometimes, you know, people are puzzled by that if they think about it at all. Now, this is paradoxical, you know, it's so important, but so neglected, but there's actually a simple explanation for this. And it is that there's not really any disagreement about, among the major parties about what we should do about healthcare. We kind of have violent agreement that we should pretty well do nothing. No one wants to touch healthcare because it's the third rail. That's, you touch that, you get electrocuted. So we kind of stay away from it so that the leaders don't fight about it. Uh, every party, at least superficially, believes in Medicare. It's our national religion, rah-rah, motherhood and apple pie in Canada is actually Medicare and Tommy Douglas. So there's no discussion except around the margins. Um, one of the federal government's principal roles in healthcare is to transfer money to the provinces. So that's not very exciting to talk about or, you know, to, to uh, even debate. Uh, all the parties have committed to increase the funding transfers, which are about $40 billion currently. They've all committed to uh, increase them by 3% annually. So again, no discussion, no debate. There is this time around some discussion of pharmacare, uh, an issue that we've been debating in Canada for approximately 60 years. It's been ramped up a little bit recently, but again, we didn't hear about it in the, in the leaders' debates, except in passing. Uh, Mr. Singh made a passing reference to pharmacare. But how do we explain that? Again, the public is not too passionate about this, and the politicians don't have simple solutions, so it gets cast aside. Now, you may be surprised that I say the public's not interested, uh, and it's because even though we have a system that's expensive and inefficient, we have 102 public drug plans in Canada and thousands of private drug plans, but the vast majority of people actually have drug insurance. Even though it's not well organized, most people make do, so they don't get too excited about it. But there have been some promises out there. The Green Party has promised a, a massive national pharmacare program that uh, would cost $27 billion in the first year. But we know that, you know, the less uh, a, a party has a chance of being elected, the more bold their promises are. So that's, that's natural. Uh, coming next is the NDP. They would spend a more modest $10 billion a year uh, for pharmacare. So these are nice plans in theory, but realistically, uh, I, th I think we have to say it's not going to happen. E even the Liberals uh, have promised a modest $6 billion for pharmacare over four years. So that's, that's not going to do it. They say it's going to kickstart the discussion, and it would barely do that with a, a billion or so a year. So bottom line, I'm sad to say, we're probably going to be talking about this for a while longer. Now, the only other significant health-related promise from the parties is about opioids and overdoses. This is the worst public health crisis in Canada in generations. Again, it's not getting sufficient attention. Uh, one person dies every two hours of Canada of an, in Canada of an opioids overdose. It's, it's quite a stunning figure. So what are the pr parties promising? Uh, they're promising to do a little more of the same, a little bit of harm reduction, a little bit of treatment, a little bit of this and that. Uh, the Liberals have pledged $700 million more, the NDP $400 million, and the Conservatives a more modest $36 million. Uh, the Green Party, for its part, has promised to decriminalize all drugs, which is probably the most bold policy pronouncement, but again, the chances of it happening are, are slim to nil. And let me just note one last health issue uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, in June, the Liberals released a dementia strategy. Again, this is of interest here. And it included $50 million over five years. So that's a start. But as advocates have said, uh, they actually, uh, the ask was for 50 million a year. So again, we tend to do half measures in Canada when we, when we do act. 
and no party to my knowledge has, has pledged to do more. And I, I hosted recently a, an all-party debate on the dementia strategy and nobody promised anything. So, so another depressing uh, turn. So, so let me move, move to something more esoteric so I won't depress you as much. And I want to spend the rest of my time talking about this, is how do we better communicate about these issues, about health, about science, about the challenges, about the limitations? Uh, how can you, your scientists, researchers, clinicians, how can you convince governments and by extension convince the public to invest more, more and more smartly in these areas? Because I think the more smartly is the important part of the equation. Uh, how can we raise the level of public discourse about health and science? Now, as you know, in many ways, we're in the midst of a war on science, a war on truth, and it has a figurehead who happens to be the President of the United States. So a very, one of the most powerful people in the world is an enemy of science. That's a sad reality today, and it says a lot about the state of the world. And we have growing numbers of people who don't believe in, in truth, in facts, in vaccines, in climate change, in evidence. And not all of them are because of the, the president. He's cashing in, he's speaking to a population that's already there. And why, why does this exist? And I think that's a, a really deep cultural phenomenon. I don't think it's about science, I think it's about culture. It's a lot of it is people who are feeling <coughs> hopeless and lost and scared and they're looking for things to cling to and they're creating their own truths and their own realities. And that's not gonna be an easy fix but you have to try and do your part in that. Uh, you know, the, we can't live in a world where facts be damned. We're, we're not gonna uh, get through things uh, properly if we do that. So how do we communicate evidence-based science and health information in this hostile environment? I'm looking for the people later to show me how, but this I don't think is a hostile environment, so it'll be a little easier. But how do you as researchers and future researchers, how do you keep your head above water? Uh, how do you keep your research funding and your jobs in a world where quacks like Dr. Oz and Gwyneth Paltrow as seen, are seen as the most credible purveyors of science? You know, that's sad. Now, I think the best advice I can offer is, it's a bit glib, but I think the best advice I can offer is an old Curtis Mayfield song, which goes, keep on keeping on. So what do I mean by that, by that old soul song? What I mean is the best way to promote science is to do good science. That's the bottom line. That's the only message you have to retain from what I say tonight. All the other stuff is fla-fla, as we say in French. You know, the best way to promote mainstream medicine is to deliver good care. So we have to keep our eye on the ball, just keep on doing it despite a lot of the challenges. And I think we need to also keep some context around what's happening, around the the naysayers and the anti-vaxxers, et cetera. We have to remember that the vast majority of the public is eminently sensible. Uh, to a large degree, we've created an environment for so-called alternative medicine to flourish and for conspiracy theories to take root, but there's still a very tiny minority of people. We've made mistakes that have got us into this pickle. We've over-promised on medicine, uh, We've allowed greed to run rampant, especially in the pharma industry. Uh, we've created systems of healthcare delivery and scientific publication that reward volume over quality. So we've done a lot of things to make people unhappy and skeptical. Uh, we've given people, even sensible people, a lot of reason to doubt science and medicine. And we have to figure out how to turn that around. But again, I come back to we have to keep the scale of the problem in context. This is not unfixable. This is not a mountain. This is a bunch of irritating molehills. So let's use the issue of vaccination as an example. This is something that causes a lot of gnashing of teeth, people abandoning vaccines. The childhood vaccination rate in this country is still upwards of 90%. We're not doing so bad. Uh, the really fierce anti-vaxxers are less than 2% of the population. So we can't let them scare us into doing ridiculous things. Uh, we can't give too much attention to the loud, obnoxious trolls because that's what they want. 
And we can't spend all of our energy trying to reason with them because for the most part, they're not convertible. They're not, we're not gonna change their minds. We have to write off a certain amount, that 2% of, of crazies, for lack of a better term. What we need to pay attention to are the vaccine hesitant, those people with doubts and fears, real and imagined. A growing number of parents uh, are delaying vaccines and embracing so-called alternative vaccine schedules. These are not crazy people. These are well-meaning, thoughtful parents, and that's what should really worry us. Why are they all sitting on the fence? Why are they filled with doubt? I think as scientists, as public health officials, as the media, we actually have no one to blame for ourselves, but ourselves for this growing group of skeptics. We've created them. Uh, in Canada, there are 13 different childhood vaccine schedules. Why is that? Uh, who can blame a parent for thinking there's no right or wrong way if the experts can't even agree on a simple schedule of when children should be vaccinated? So we have to get our act together. We have to be clear, communicate better, uh, set better comprehensible policies. The other problem I mentioned is that we overpromise and underdeliver, And this is especially true in medicine and in drugs especially. Uh, health and science research is filled with hyperbole. Uh, we knock a gene out on a few mice and suddenly we're declaring that we have a cure for cancer. That serves no one, that serves no purpose except creating false hope and skepticism. And yes, I'll be the first to admit that the media plays a large and unfortunate role in the hype, but we're not alone. I can't just blame the messenger. Uh, university and hospital communications teams, uh, researchers, medical journals, all of them are driven by a desire for more attention, for more donations. So there's a lot of incentive to, to hype things up. At the other end of the spectrum is research that may be important, but doesn't get publicized at all. And why is that? Uh, because it's buried in specialized journals. It's written in a Byzantine manner. Uh, it doesn't have a communications team behind it to, to hype it. You know, the language of medicine, the language of science can be complicated. As journalists, that's our job. We're essentially translators. We take this Byzantine language and try and make it comprehensible to the public. And a lot of your research is, you know, let's face it, it's obscure. And that doesn't mean it's bad or unimportant, but it's obscure. So how do you convince funders and the public that it's important? Now, recently I had the pleasure of participating in a, an event uh, sponsored by the Nobel Prize where I interviewed uh, Nobel Prize winners on stage. It was a fascinating event. And I asked them some of the questions that I've set out to you rhetorically. And they had some really interesting insight, which I'm gonna steal and call it research. Now, first of all, they noted that scientists and researchers shortchange themselves. And they do so by not articulating very well the benefits of science. Uh, too often you take for granted what you do. You assume that people should, you know, People should know what we're doing is good. You can't take anything for granted anymore. It's not enough to do work in your lab or in your clinic. You have to do the outreach. You have to do events like this and you have to do them in every venue possible. High schools, uh, hospitals, shopping malls. You have to get out there and spread the word, the gospel, if you will, because you can be sure that the people who are uh, spreading the gospel of, of true untruth and of uh, hype and of so-called alternative medicine. They're doing the job and you have to do it as well or better than they are. Now, I often say that when you advocate, you need to speak the language of the person you're trying to influence. That's really important. Uh, when you speak to the public, you need to highlight the benefits to them and their families and their treatments. You need to tell stories, heart-grabbing stories. When you speak to funders and politicians, you need to speak the language of money. You need to say, as, as Dr. Smith said, you know, we're in a brain economy. We have to invest in the brain. It's not enough to be cutting down trees anymore. Canada has to think a little smarter and a little further ahead. The reality is that science and health are tremendous economic drivers, and you don't talk about that enough. There are 1.2 million people employed in Canada's health system, one of the biggest employers in the country. That's stuff that politicians will pay attention to. You also have to fight back against disparaging, dismissive language. Uh, you know, we hear people think, say things like, oh, that's just curiosity-driven research. It's done in ivory towers. And that's not the kind of language you accept, should accept. 
You know, there's no innovation, there's no product, there's no drug, there's no treatment that didn't begin with a question. A re sometimes a mundane question. Everything you do is about finding a problem and trying to solve that problem. And we solve problems through curiosity. So that's how you have to fashion yourself. You're not doing, you're doing curiosity-driven research, but you're not doing it in ivory towers and you're not doing it for nothing. You're doing it for, for people, for your families, for your neighbors. The reality is things don't happen. Things quickly in science, science is incremental, self-correcting over time. Uh, there's a long pipeline between understanding a basic principle and its application. Uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners I interviewed, it had been 25 years since his discovery, which got no attention. Eh, he found out how to put a little glowing uh, protein into a worm. Yeah, ho hum. He said he had, you know, five people read the journal, that was it. Today, that glowing worm is used in every lab around the world. It's used for all kinds, it's used to make glow sticks. Uh, in fact, he mentioned uh, the incredible Ang Lee had come to him and used that as the basis for his incredible Hulk movie, The Glowing Worm. So all kinds of things you never could have imagined came from a very simple discovery. And a very simple question, how can I see these stupid transparent worms better? <laughs> so these, there's no bad questions uh, and we're often just a little too impatient. So there's this long pipeline between the un the understanding of a basic principle and its application. And as I said, ideas can take years and decades to work their way through the pipeline. So what you have to convince the public and the politicians of is we need to invest the research in research to keep the pipeline open. If the pipeline's not open, there is no hope, there is no innovation. The problem is that funders are often impatient. Uh, they obsess about results and commercial applications in the short term and they don't think enough about the long term. But every single, I think, important discovery has always started with some serendipity. You have to create an environment for, for learning and for asking questions. Now just imagine if we applied the logic of funders, of science funders, to other things in our lives. Important things like sports. <laughs> now the Toronto Maple Leafs would have been disbanded long ago if they had the same criteria as science, scientists have. They haven't won a Stanley Cup since 1967. They have failed. Why should we fund them? Why should we buy tickets to their games? Well, it's because in sports, we hope against hope. And we should do in science too, because the payoffs are even greater. In science, there are many, many Stanley Cups and many teams better than the Leafs. I guess I shouldn't say that in Toronto, I'm from Montreal. <laughs> uh, many teams better than the Habs, so sorry. Uh, I've got to correct my notes there. So instead of talking about curiosity-driven research, we should be talking about problem-solving research. That's what you want to do ultimately, is solve problems. And it's essentially what you do every day. You try and solve problems, big and small. And the best way to do that, again, is creating this environment where researchers can push boundaries, where they can exchange ideas, and where, very importantly, they can fail and still be rewarded for it, because failure is important. The most prosperous and groundbreaking companies in the world, the Apples, the Microsofts, they spend about 20% of all their revenues on research and development, because they know it's important. They know they wouldn't exist without innovation. By contrast, in our health system, we spend about 1.5% of our revenue on research. So are we surprised that there isn't a lot of innovation? And maybe I shouldn't put it that way because I don't think that's fair. I think there is a lot of innovation in healthcare, but a lot of it is informal. It's workarounds that clinicians have to do every day to make the system more workable, uh, a system that hasn't adapted to modern times. Uh, the big problem we have in healthcare is not lack of innovation, it's lack of implementation. We have many successes and we fail to embrace them and to scale them up. As someone who's been writing about healthcare for more than three decades, that's my biggest frustration. Uh, knowing that we've solved every problem we have 10 times over in pilot projects, but we fail to scale up what works and it's frustrating. We're terribly fearful of failure. 
In private enterprise, researchers fail repeatedly every single day, and that's okay, because that's the only way you can learn, is by making a mistake, correcting it, and finding a better way. Now, my time's almost up, so I want to come back to, I want to touch on two last questions before I wrap up. I want to come back to the issue of communication again. So as a journalist, when I write about research, when my colleagues write about research, we give the conclusion first, and then we give the explanations. As researchers, you tend to give explanations first, and then by the time we get to the conclusion, sometimes we're asleep. Let's, let's be honest. I read a lot of medical journals, and they're, they're a slog. Now, you should be able to give a sense of your research in an elevator pitch, or in a Twitter-length soundbite, or in a TED Talk. And that's your challenge. You have to do that over and over again. And I don't want to hear people say that that's dumbing down, because it isn't. It's the opposite of dumbing down. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest minds of all time, said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And that's true. Uh, the best researchers can uh, explain their research very, very succinctly. Now, today I've been speaking about amplifying your voice. How do you do that? How do you get science to the public? How do you get attention? How do you get money? But I want to say that simply amplifying the same old voices isn't sufficient. Uh, science has to do a much better job of diversity and gender equity. And thankfully, this is starting to get some media attention. But the research shows time and time again that women receive far fewer grants, far fewer new investigator awards. They're paid less. Uh, they're less likely to be promoted. I saw a study recently that said 40% of all panels at science conferences are men only. Now there's a Twitter hashtag, no more manals, that it was created to call this out. Now it's funny, but it's a real problem. It's a significant problem. Uh, young women, like my daughter, my daughter just graduated in neuroscience, and I get choked up at it, the very thought, my little baby. But, Young women like my daughter are attracted to medicine and science. In fact, they dominate the ranks of universities today in many disciplines. But we have real trouble with retention. And why is that? It's because of the problems I noted. They're not getting equitable opportunities. Uh, they're still being subjected to sexism, to harassment. We have to do better. And it's bad for women, but it's doubly true for people of color, people with disabilities, and so on. Now, good science is important, but people also need to see themselves in the science, and they also have to be representative, or else we won't ask the right questions and find the right answers. So again, I'm out of time, so I want to touch on one last thing, science literacy. The prejudices we have, the doubts that we have about science, they begin early in life. Uh, they're infectious in some ways. We get our bad ideas from our parents, just like our good ideas. So if we're going to counter the skepticism, the anti-science bias, the war on science, we have to start early. It, it all begins in school. I think that's where the solution ultimately lies. We have to give tools to children the tools to separate sense from nonsense. We have to teach them how to navigate this awful new digital world where you can, anything is out there and they have to figure out what's true. We have to make science fun, not dreary. I know when I studied science in school, it was awful. It's better now, but it could be much better. When I meet Nobel Prize winners like Canadians, like Donna Strickland and Art MacDonald, what strikes me is just how much they love what they do. And that matters. All of you are here because you were inspired by someone. You were inspired by a teacher, a parent, or you were inspired by something, a curiosity, a puzzle a family tragedy. Now, the one thing we can't teach is passion, but we can create opportunities for people to find their passion and to act on it. And once you have that, you can share your passion, you can inspire others, you can find answers. So I want to thank you to list for listening, and above all, I want to thank you for the work you do, and more importantly, the work you're going to do, because some of us are getting really old, and we're going to need your innovations and your big brains to, to solve a lot of the world's problems. So thank you again for the invitation. I look forward to it.
Thank you very much, Andre. Wow, there, there was so much to think about. You covered such a huge range of topics. Not surprised, though. I mean, it was, like your columns, very knowledge-rich knowledge, knowledge rich, um, and wise. And I do like the summaries that you provided on such important aspects of healthcare. Uh, particularly, too, I did like, if I can call it, your call to action. Uh, which is what he was doing, right? It's a call to action for scientists. Um, do good science, right? Keep it simple and spread the message. That is so important today. You need to spread the message, as he was saying, in places like this, in shopping malls, in conference halls, wherever you can. Um, so thank you so much. And by the way, I should say too, it really struck home when you talked at the beginning about research funding. The reason my husband is not here today is because he's working on a grant. And he'll probably be up all night working on that grant. I was waiting for you to say that. I don't know. He quoted me a stat. And tell me if this is true. I think he said that it's only about 5% of scientists who apply for funding actually get it. Is it about 5% five, 5 to 10? Not much more. Yeah. Oh, dear. Anyway, I'm, my fingers are crossed for him. He, but he works for Mount Sinai. <laughs> OK, moving on. <laughs> Um, that was a great kickoff to the evening, though. I'm really very inspirational. Uh, right now, we are going to talk about the scientists you're talking about, the young up-and-coming scientists. We have seven speakers tonight, and they are each going to give that three-minute elevator pitch. And uh, it's meant to inform you. It's meant to engage everybody here about their work to give you a good sense of it. And as I introduce each speaker, uh, please watch the video monitors for a short introduction, and then that'll be followed by the presentations. So let's begin. First up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Protza who is a scientist with the McEwen Stem Cell Institute at UHN. Stephanie's research focuses on creating pacemaker cells from the heart, and they will be able to help a human heart beat regularly and naturally on its own as an alternative to electronic pacemakers. In her spare time, Stephanie uses her own heart to enjoy running, yoga, and yes, working even more. Uh, and you can watch the video monitors now for more on what motivated Stephanie to become a scientist. So growing up in Germany, I was always interested in science. And then I went to a school trip, it's really interesting. And we went to Max Planck Institute, which was in the neighboring city. And that's where they do um, a lot of different kind of science. But one of the experiments we got to see there, are the uh, models that they use are the axolotls, which are the animals that can regenerate, which means if you can cut up an arm or a tail, they can actually regrow that. If you're not a scientist, you're seeing that as a school kid, you're like, wow, this just blew my mind. I'm like, this can be actually a job, trying to figure out how to regrow organs. And that's how I really got inspired to do science. But I always had a bit of an interest in not just doing biology, but I also was into physics. And I wanted something that's a little bit more inspiring. And the heart has electric activity, so you have your physics. It is a very functional organ. And, um, well, it is required to live. I found a lot of labs that were interested in heart research, but more basic heart research. And really studying regeneration or using cells to fix broken hearts, that is something very new. The exciting thing is, I'm just starting out. I have a whole career ahead of me. I have like 30 years of work ahead of me that I can spend doing research and my goal is to eventually hopefully have made a cell type and to really develop the biological pacemaker that can go into people one day. Welcome everyone. I would actually like to start by asking you a favor. Can you please all take two fingers to your wrist to feel your pulse like that? Yeah, there. The reason you feel your pulse right now is because of your heart that pumps blood through your body. And that's pretty crucial because it supplies all your organs with oxygen and nutrients. Throughout your lifespan, your heart will beat about two billion times. And it does that at a resting rate of 60 beats per minute. And that's exactly what you're feeling right now at your wrist. But why does your heart beat? How does this actually work? The heart is a pretty complicated organ. It contains muscle cells that generate the force to pump blood. But if these muscle cells would just beat to their own rhythm, the heart would just wobble around real slow. The reason we have an organized heartbeat is thanks to the pacemaker cells of the heart that initiate and coordinate the heartbeat as shown in this animation. 
and it is these pacemaker cells that initiate each of your two billion heartbeats. Unfortunately, these pacemaker cells can get damaged due to diseases or aging, resulting in a too slow heartbeat to the extent that patients just lose consciousness. The current standard treatment for those patients is the implantation of an electronic pacemaker device that is made of a battery pack and two leads that are placed into the heart that now take over the activation of the heartbeat. Currently about 21,000 electronic pacemakers are implanted per year in Canada alone. We're looking at all over North America, but 250,000 devices are implanted annually. And currently 3 million people in North America are living with an electronic pacemaker. And for those patients, the pacemaker is great because it saves their lives. But it is an electric device, and these patients actually have to undergo surgeries to replace the batteries every five to 10 years. This becomes even more complicated if we think about pediatric patients. Not only do they need the recurrent battery replacements, but the device does also not adjust to the growth of the heart, requiring even more surgeries. And this is where I feel we can do better and where my research comes in. My vision is to replace the damaged pacemaker cells with new pacemaker cells and to establish what we call a biological pacemaker without batteries, without wires. But now you may ask, but where will she take those new pacemaker cells from? And that's where I get to introduce the work we do in the lab. We're working with pluripotent stem cells and these are unique because they can turn into any cell type of the body. It's a little bit like magic. You can culture them in the petri dish and turn them, for example, into liver cells, blood cells, or heart cells. So we should also be able to turn them into pacemaker cells. And that's exactly what we do. What you see in this video are human pacemaker cells made in the petri dish in my lab. It takes us about three weeks to turn the stem cells into these pacemaker cells. But it's not as easy as it sounds. Me and my colleagues spent about five years trying to figure out how to turn the stem cells into pacemaker cells. We're currently using preclinical models to test if these pacemaker cells can actually function as a biological pacemaker. And it could still be 10 years or more before we'll be actually able to transplant the first biological pacemaker into a human heart. As many of you know, the pace of research is rather slow. But now the real work begins. And what keeps me going is my motivation curiosity, and most of all, the motivation to improve the treatment for the millions of people living with heart diseases in Canada and worldwide. Thank you. Stephanie, I'd like more brain cells. <laughs> if you could work on that, that would help me. That was great. That was great. Okay, that's just a sample of uh, what's in store tonight. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, up next is Dr. Bastien Moineau. Uh, Bastien has been a postdoctoral fellow with the KITE Research Institute at Toronto Rehab. I'm assuming KITE is an acronym, not actually a KITE, um, <laughs> which is part of UHN since January 2016. One of his favorite quotes, quotes comes from Mark Twain. They did not know it was impossible so they did it, which I guess is a much smarter way of saying ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and that fits perfectly with his focus on developing technology for people with spinal cord injury and stroke to help them regain mobility and independence. It's been about eight years now that I've been doing research. It's really something I've grown into as I was doing my training. I worked uh, a lot with people who had had a stroke. As I was doing like mostly clinical uh, work, I, I still had this pool of like, oh, I kind of miss research, I, I'd like to, to do more. And that's when I started looking for a postdoctoral position. I arrived in Toronto in 2016 and started working on uh, this amazing technology. FES, which is a functional electrical stimulation, uh, is a technique to make muscles that are weak or paralyzed, uh, to make those muscles contract, to try to recreate movement. The textile itself can conduct electricity because it's made of a yarn that can conduct electricity. So it's really this idea of assistive stimulation. The reason I'm so passionate about this technology is that this could be really a groundbreaking in the rehab world.
imagine it's 3 p.m. You're still at work. You're getting a call from Toronto Western Hospital. Your father had a stroke and his left side is paralyzed. Or maybe it's Sunny Brooks emergency and they say your daughter had a bike accident and can barely move her legs. This type of story is happen every day with tens of thousands of Canadians becoming paralyzed every year. How could we help them recover some mobility and independence? What if we could help your dad retrain his left arm by putting on a simple shirt? Or help your daughter stand up by putting on some special leggings? That's what we're trying to do with our research participant. What happened to your dad, to your daughter in my story, it happened to them. Suddenly, their entire life changed. Initially, things were very busy. They had to go to emergency. Then they had to stay in rehabilitation for a while. There, they were given some physical exercises. The objective was to um, regain control of their bodies and as much of their independence as possible. However, even when trying their best, certain gestures or mobility do not come back. Being paralyzed means certain tasks, some as simple as dressing or eating, are impossible to do independently. Uh, imagine how frustrating that could be. It, it would be to not be able to do things by yourself. Some people cannot even scratch their nose. Um, so that's why we're trying to help them retrain their brain and regain control of their muscles. In the video before, you saw my leg rise and Jackson's hand open and close. It wasn't us moving, it was electrical stimulation. The electricity going through the garment makes the muscle contract strongly enough to create a useful movement. FES has been so useful for people with paralysis. However, today, to get FES, you need to go to a physical clinic who has the equipment, spend about an hour there, then go come back home. More likely than not, that's three hours of your day. Now, you know how your family's life is, how busy it is, like with work, your, school, your kids at school, sport? Um, try to fit today free, a three hours time slot in your week. Imagine that. Imagine now for somebody who has paralysis, who takes more time for many activities, who may need help for transportation. So that's why we, we want to facilitate access to FES. Um, so that's why we're working uh, at Toronto Rob Institute uh, and with a company, Mayant, on those uh, FES garments. In the past three years, we have been working at making them easier to build, easier to put on, and easier to use. As I'm talking now, we are still improving that technology. Our goal is to make rehabilitation garment that uh, people with paralysis can use in the comfort of their home, alone, or with their relatives to regain as much of independence as possible. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, Vesha. I had not heard about that. It's clothing, right? It's just clothing that you put on that allows you this mobility. That's oh, amazing. Good luck with your work. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Shane Harding, a scientist with the Princess Margaret Cancer Center at UHN. Shane's lab studies fundamental aspects of DNA damage repair. He's especially interested in how radiation can be combined with immunotherapy to improve both of those treatments. And also, very important, uh, help reduce side effects for cancer patients. Uh, in addition to those pursuits, Shane also can add woodworking and beer brewing to his accomplishments, which I'm sure helps his research. I went to my undergrad degree thinking I was going to do psychology and forensic science, uh, I guess sucked in by the CSI that was the rage at the time. And I realized when I was there that that wasn't something I was that excited about. Um, but I was excited about how cells work at the very fundamental level and was introduced to DNA damage responses, so how the cell maintains its information and how when that changes, that can cause cancer development. My lab studies fundamental aspects of DNA damage repair. We're especially interested in how radiation can be combined with immunotherapy to improve both of those treatments in patients. It's as exciting to me now as it was as a naive person at the time when I was watching those shows to see what science can do and what's possible in the lab. Ready, set, ride! So when I did the ride to conquer cancer this year, it was a really motivational experience when you see former patients that are riding, that are thanking you on the ride, and you explain that you're a scientist and that this is sort of what you've dedicated your life to. 
everyone has some connection to cancer, whether it's a direct family member or a close friend. There's always someone in your life that has suffered from the disease. We need to find a way that we can prolong their life and not only prolong their life, but prolong the, their quality life and give them hope with tackling the disease and treatments that are effective for them. From my, my perspective, it's the biology that's really gonna help us to make those advances. Thank you. I was a curious child. Uh, my father recounts a story about how at the end of a long day I wanted to ask my mother another question and she said to me, Shane, I just don't think I can answer another question today. And my response to her was, but mom, if I don't ask questions, how will I ever learn? As scientists asking questions and, and doggedly pursuing those, the answers to those questions is fundamental to our process. It's how we learn. I'm going to tell you a little story about how asking these questions and the persistence in answering those questions can teach us something about how we treat a disease that will affect half of Canadians directly, and that disease is cancer. Our immune system is amazing. It can detect cancer in the body and eliminate it, but cancer is smart and it finds ways to avoid the immune system and to hide from it. Immunotherapy is arguably the most important advance in cancer treatment in the last 50 years. And it uh, unmasks the cancer and allows the immune system to see it again and eliminate it from the body. Unfortunately, on its own, immunotherapy it doesn't work for all patients. My career and training has really focused on how radiation is used to kill cancer cells, and it does. About half of all cancer patients are treated with radiation with the intent to cure that patient. Um, unfortunately, like immunotherapy, that doesn't always work. But we asked, what if we were to combine radiation with immunotherapy, could we make those treatments better? So we dedicated ourselves to this problem and we found that radiation actually makes cells look like they're infected with a virus. And this is exactly what the immune system is meant to deal with. But unfortunately, as you recall, the cancer has hidden itself from the immune system. So we thought, let's add immunotherapy to that. So immunotherapy unmasks the cancer and the radiation gives the immune system the kick it needs to eliminate that cancer from the body. <clears throat> Again, this doesn't work for all patients and we're searching for reasons why. <clears throat> so in the lab, we showed that combining radiation with immunotherapy could make both of these treatments better and bring these pa potentially bring this to more patients. <clears throat> we also think that uh, this viral-like response from the radiation can trigger side effects to that therapy, and we're also searching for ways that we can mitigate this. Ultimately, our goal is to make the treatments better for patients and to minimize the side effects to improve their quality of life. This is our challenge in the lab today. <clears throat> uh, three of my grandparents died of cancer. Of the nine children in my father's family, four died with cancer, and four of the five alive today are cancer survivors. This is a testament to how far we've come, but how far we still have to go. My lab and I have dedicated ourselves to this problem because we think it's a way that we can help our families, our neighbors, and strangers. <clears throat> and along the way, we hope we can inspire the next generation of scientists. And when my daughter has asked of me and her mother, all of the questions we have the energy to ask and answer in a day, I hope she persists and looks for those answers herself. Thank you. Great talk. I don't like following a baby. That's never a good thing. <laughs> All right. Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Tofik Valiente, is a neurosurgeon and director of the Surgical Epilepsy Program with the Cremville Brain Institute at Toronto Western Hospital. Also, he is a scientist at the Cremville Research Institute. Uh, he and his lab study electrical signals in the brain and how computational techniques can be applied to decode and potentially control brain activity and behavior. I'm glad you're on our side. Tofik is also a staunch advocate for the standardization of epilepsy care in Ontario. On the side, he enjoys cycling and he plays bass guitar in a band with some of his childhood friends. <laughs> Very nice, Tofik.
We grew up in a home with a lot of interest in social activism, being part of the community, and a steady diet of uh, National Geographic and Reader's Digest. You know, for my mom, I think as immigrants, I always want their kids to aspire to something, and I think for her, medicine was a noble thing. If there's one thing that sort of captures kind of the essence of the influence that, you know, she had on us was the, the idea of the sky's the limit. So I should always say that. I ended up graduating from high school early, and I started university when I was 16. I was looking through my courses for my next semester, and I came across this guy, Ken Norwich, and he had an MD and a PhD, and I thought, oh my God, it's like, you know, you can be an MD and you can take care of people, and you can be a PhD, and you know everything about everything. It's like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. For me, scientifically, it kind of started to develop when I was in my early teens, was the idea that epilepsy was sort of this different state of the brain, and, and if I could understand epilepsy, then I could understand the brain. I think as a surgeon, particularly in the context of epilepsy, the hope is that surgery then will help them with the rest of their life. Adjustment for epilepsy patients is very difficult because imagine living with something for a good part of your life and then not having it. What does life look like? Well, some people actually don't adjust at all to that kind of state. In many ways, I think that that surgery is just a tiny fraction of the care that you can afford somebody. The work we've done in the community to try to create, you know, better resources. My lab's taken it up and, you know, it's really, it's great to watch them now sort of independently drive the outreach of the lab. They put on the Purple Day in the atrium. They're out doing a walk for epilepsy. I think it's important that, especially in medicine, the research is not to abstract yourself too far from the very people that you're trying to figure stuff out from. The brain is vast. The brain is complex. And I think that mystery is, is just even heightened further when you're a neuroscientist because you want to kind of crack that code. Okay, good evening everybody. I didn't realize they're going to have diaper pictures about me, so. Um, so I grew up on tons of science fiction. Hours of Star Wars and Star Trek and the Six Million Dollar Man. I just wanted to be part of that world. And, you know, now as a neurosurgeon, as a neuroscientist, I have the absolute privilege to actually be part of that world. I've always wanted to understand the brain, and I've always wanted to understand epilepsy, because I felt that epilepsy, if I could understand epilepsy, I could understand the brain. Think of a seizure as a storm, an electrical storm within the brain. Individuals with epilepsy suffer from unpredictable seizures through much of their life. <clears throat> In the, in the context of epilepsy, then, um, a, an individual, a, a famous a physicist named Richard Feynman, once said that if you can understand something, you should be able to explain it simply. And that if you can understand, and it's also being said that if you can understand something, that you should be able to fix it. So I want to understand the brain so that I can fix epilepsy. One way that we're doing this is through a device that we've created called Neurop, the Neural Interface Processor. It's a computer chip, but it's not any kind of computer chip. Neurop is able to, in fact, determine when a seizure is about to happen and then gently stimulate the brain to stop the seizure from taking place. The, uh, it's not easy to understand where seizures are coming from within the brain, and it's also even more difficult to understand when they're going to happen. So Neurop listens to brain signals from these implanted electrodes often hundreds within the brain. Epilepsy surgery is like real estate. It's location, location, location. And so we very strategically implant electrodes within the brain to understand where the seizures are coming from. Neurop samples brain activity 250 times per second and then analyzes the brain activity over a million times per second to understand when the seizure is going to start. That's pretty amazing. We also store this, this information offline <clears throat> so that we can use machine learning algorithms on more powerful computers to help Neurop learn. Through this, we can actually identify a very specific fingerprint of brain activity, like identifying a needle in a haystack, pinpointing when a seizure is going to start. We then transfer that fingerprint to Neurop. Neurop is always listening for a seizure. There's also many ways to stimulate the brain electrically. And so Neurop is also looking for the best pattern of stimulation to stop a seizure. 
In Europe is hard at work within our epilepsy program, our 10-bed epilepsy monitoring unit, <clears throat> here at the Toronto Western Hospital. And it's demonstrating that 98% of the time that it can, can, it can, in fact, identify the beginning of a seizure. So what kind of device, so what, where will these devices take us to in the future? One way that we're exploring this is in fact by stimulating a structure in the brain called the hippocampus that is critical for memory and learning. And we're hoping that we can understand if we, how we can improve those aspects of brain function. So these devices, like Neurop, not only potentially could help patients, but they can also teach us critical new information about the brain. Science fiction is what our brain dreams up today that then becomes a reality of tomorrow. Like Captain Kirk communicator 50 years ago, which is now the modern day smartphone. I believe that we're at the beginning of, of the dream to create a device that can both fix and explain the brain. When that dream is realized, I will be, not only be able to fix the brain by stopping seizures, but I promise that I'll explain the brain simply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tafik. And of course, you'll come back here and explain it in three minutes when that happens. <laughs> Okay, up next, uh, Dr. Beata Sander uh, holds a, Can a Canada Research Chair in Economics of Infectious Diseases and is also a scientist and director of Population Health Economics Research at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute at UHN. Uh, she's a member of the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations and often provides scientific advice to governmental policymakers. As part of her commitment to global health initiatives, Beata also teaches a course on health economics at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. In her spare time, she likes to cheer on her favorite Toronto sports team, no, not the Raptors, the Toronto High Park Football Club, because her daughter plays there. I was always interested in global health, global development, so I did a master's in economics of development in Australia. During that time, I discovered health economics. Simulation modeling really helps in a way that you can try out all kinds of things that you may never be able to try in real life. For influenza, we know it's spreading by respiratory transmission. So what if that was a pandemic and the virus spreads really fast? Do we close schools and tell kids to stay home? Can we vaccinate everyone or do we have to prioritize specific population group. And so all those things we can try out in a model. The evidence we provide to decision makers leads to decisions that affect the entire population, so millions of people. I think it's just so humbling to think about the potential impact of your work. I started my career as an ICU nurse back in Germany. I loved working with patients, and I loved the challenges of working in such a busy and dynamic environment. But I wanted to have a greater impact in the world. So I went back to school to learn about business, economic development, and health economics. I got fascinated by the unpredictability of pathogens and started to understand the devastating impact infectious diseases can have. I wondered, is there a better way to plan ahead? That's where our work using computer simulation comes in. Oh, that was the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> there are alerts uh, every day, anytime, anywhere in the world, which may or may not result in the worldwide spread of a new disease, a pandemic. Between 2011 and 2018, the WHO tracked 1,483 epidemic events in 172 countries, some of which turned out to be devastating, like SARS, Zika, and Ebola. In 1918, an influenza pandemic infected one-third of the world's population, killing an estimated 50 million people. If a similar pandemic happened today, 
with a population four times larger and travel times anywhere in the world less than 36 hours, 50 to 80 million people could die. It could cause panic, disrupt national security, and seriously impact global economy, costing us three trillion US dollars. The poor would suffer the most. Imagine, somewhere halfway around the world, 60% of a town's population is sickened by a respiratory illness of unknown origin. The local government believes it to be due or caused by a seasonal influenza. So one patient tests positive for a novel influenza A virus. Two babies died in the outbreak, but both were buried without testing. What if Within two weeks, there was widespread influenza activity in Canada. What if, in less than three months, over 50 countries were affected and over 600,000 people died, mostly young adults? What if, if there was no effective vaccine for another six months? The question is, are we ready? To answer this question, we use computer simulation to recreate reality, just like VR or video games such as SimCity. We recreate reality, we recreate reality with all the elements that are important for solving the problems we, want, uh, we are interested in. We recreate virtual populations where people live in families and neighborhoods and there are schools and workplaces, and we tell our virtual population what they do every day. We can introduce the virus and try out all the what-if scenarios and observe what happens. We can close schools. We can tell infected people to stay home. Do we have a vaccine? Can we vaccinate everyone, or do we need to prioritize specific population groups? Using computer simulation, we can figure out the best course of action ahead of time. Our work informs policy decisions for millions of people, not only when planning for a pandemic, but also answering questions such as, should we publicly fund pneumococcal vaccines, or test the vaccine for shingles, or seasonal influenza vaccine? If so, for whom? Being a nurse helps me understand the clinical implications of the policy decisions we inform. I often think about the patients I treated in the ICU, which helps me remember whom our work is for. You, me, our patients, our families and friends, making sure everyone is safe. That's the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Viata. What an interesting career trajectory you've had, going from ICU nurse to, yeah, a health economist. Uh, up next, we have Jimmy Q. Jimmy Q, who is not a hairstylist or a fashion designer. <laughs> no, with a name like that. Uh, no, Jimmy Q leads the surgility, which I didn't even know was a word. <laughs> surgility, I'm not quite sure what that is, and augmented reality programs at TECNA, the Institute for the Advancement of Technology for Health at UHN. As an academic and engineer, Jimmy is passionate about developing engineering solutions to improve patient outcomes. His current research focuses on image-guided navigation technology to assist surgeons in the operating room. Outside of work, Jimmy actively participates in events across the Toronto tech and creative community, including Hacking Health Toronto, Tech for Good, Idea Boost, and the Foundry Music Festival. So I came to Canada when I was nine. In terms of English, I only knew one, two, three, four. I really fell in love with Canada as a country, and I appreciated the hardship that my parents faced. Both my parents are engineers by profession in China. My mom had to sacrifice a lot starting over her career. I visited U of T in one of my high school summers for a lecture to learn about um, cybernetics and robotics. 
And that's what really captivated me to apply to University of Toronto. I remember my first job was a dishwasher at Golden Griddle and all the money I had, I, I saved for books. In terms of transitioning to healthcare, I had a placement at Princess Margaret Hospital that was in the radiation physics department. And afterwards, my summers were always with the hospital. And um, through my work, I really learned to appreciate the challenges in the health system. Techno is a perfect fit in that I'm always learning new things. So I'm always challenged by new problems as well. The major thing that we are working on, especially with augmented reality, for example, is to better contextualize information. Deep down, I, I love using technology to improve someone's experience. And I think ultimately, that's what I find joy in. As you have just heard in my video, I came to Canada as a young boy. And it was a very eye-opening experience. Everything was different, the language, the people, even the food. I had to adapt to the challenges and differences in this new world, and it wasn't easy. For my whole life, I learned to bridge two worlds, and that experience has led me to where I am today. Working to bridge the gap between engineering and healthcare, to develop new technology, and help medical teams save lives. My name is Jimmy Q. I'm an engineering manager and researcher at Techno Institute. My work focuses on technology for image guidance and augmented reality to help transform surgical agility and precision in the operating room. And that's not a small thing, because it's hard to create that kind of change, especially in an environment where medical teams are often dealing with life or death scenarios. So here's how it works. Imagine navigation with GPS in your car, but for the human body. We can take technology like electromagnetic tracking or optical tracking to determine location of different surgical instruments, either through a small electrical current or vision of a sensor that's attached to the tool. But unlike driving in your car or navigating on a flat 2D surface, we have to consider everything in 3D including critical structures like arteries or nerves that may be in the way. That's the challenge we help to address with our surgeons in the OR. As surgery become less invasive, think of laparoscopy, for example. There are new challenges we need to consider. Take, for example, a patient with lung cancer. To accurately diagnose the disease and determine how far it's advanced, we take a bronchoscope or a flexible camera and insert that into the lung. The problem is that airway branches all look very similar. So how, how can a surgeon steer down the correct path each and every time? Especially as the branches become more narrow and far apart. What about a patient with bone cancer? In order to remove the tumor, the surgeon needs to be aware of the extent of the disease, as well as the planned margin, say five millimeters, in order to help maintain structural integrity and reduce the chance of recurrence. That margin could be the difference between a 5% and 50% chance of cancer recurrence. But they don't see this picture. During surgery, they see the, the tumor on the bone, but not the extent. And often, it's hidden by soft tissue. Let's go back to the example of the lung cancer patient. We can take the patient MRI or CT scan to plan out the path that the surgeon should take. With electromagnetic tracking, we can know exactly where the bronchoscope is going and help the surgeon steer the tool along the correct path. We can overlay this path information and direction directly over the bronchoscopic video. We also present a bird's eye view so that the surgeon can contextualize where the bronchoscope is in relation to the entire path or the anatomy of the patient. Augmented reality is bringing the future into the OR. By expanding the field of view, directly over the surgical field. Take the example of the bone cancer patient. We can take the MRI and CT scan to create a 3D model and visualize over the top of that model the extent of the disease, the set of cuts the surgeon needs to perform, as well as the surgical margin. We can add an optical sensor to the osteotome 
which is like a bone chisel, and give the same type of positioning feedback that we give to aircraft pilots. With mobile and headset technologies, we can now contextualize and combine all this information directly over the, uh, directly over the operating field. In the videos that you see, we're taking data from optical tracking along with the CT information and the planning data and visualizing it in augmented reality over a 3D printed model. And then that's being done on an iPad and the Microsoft HoloLens headset. Combining these technologies will help surgeons be more precise than ever. Those are just a few examples of the technologies we're working on right now. But the applications of them are limitless. In the future, we'll be able to help surgeons perform operations together from across the world, remotely. We'll be able to enable voice command technologies and gesture control for touch-free interactions in the OR. And we can use these technologies to help standardize surgical approaches across different skill levels and reduce that skill gap. Just think of the possibilities. So, if I could go back and give little Jimmy some advice, I would tell him not to worry about the challenges ahead. I would tell him to embrace those challenges, to learn from them, and have fun. But most of all, I would help him understand and appreciate that new experiences can open up your world and change the lives of others. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jimmy. That is, that's fascinating. H how far away are we from actually having, using that? Is it still quite a long ways or? It's still some time away. Still some time away, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, our last speaker of the evening is Dr. Nicole Woods, Education Scientist and Associate Director of the Wilson Center and Scientific Director of the Institute for Education Research at UHN. A cognitive psychologist by training, Nicole's work focuses on the role of basic science training and medical knowledge in clinical diagnosis and decision making. So she's really looking at how best to structure and modify medical school curriculum to ensure that doctors' early education and training help them learn how to become better, more attentive, and well-rounded physicians. Nicole also likes to say she's a compulsive podcast listener. Is this true? Yeah. <laughs> CBC podcast by any chance? <laughs> okay. And she counts wine tasting as one of her favorite pastimes. Try beer tasting so you can work with Shane. <laughs> right? Thanks. I grew up in Toronto, in the north end of the city, in a neighborhood that was really vibrant and there were a lot of people of um, Caribbean descent and Indian descent. I'm sure a lot of my friends had um, parents who maybe went to university, but the idea about what you could be when you grew up was relatively limited. I wouldn't have imagined as a high school student or even as an early undergraduate that I could become a scientist. I actually thought I wasn't very good at science. And over time, what I realized is I just didn't know what science was. It's a way of thinking and it's a way of looking at the world and it's a way of asking questions. I'm an education scientist and so a lot of people don't know what that is. But what it means is that I'm interested in understanding the science of learning, but also trying to figure out how we can take advantage of our understanding of the science of human learning to change, modify, and challenge our education system. So I'm trying to understand how do people acquire all of this complex knowledge around medical diagnoses, treatment decisions. As far as I'm concerned, education is one of the most important areas of scientific discovery. The right type of education can change your entire life. Well, what I did not mention in that video is that growing up, I absolutely loved school. I mention it because my kids are here. I loved school. <laughs> and I loved it particularly because I was, I was good at it. You know, I, I followed the rules. I took the tests. I memorized the answers. I did all the things you were supposed to do. I realized looking back on it now that my world was just so small that it never dawned on me to question anything about it. 
I took for granted a lot of the things that I experienced in education. I never thought to ask, why do we learn the way we do? Why are they asking me all these questions? I never asked until one day I did. When I started university, an entire world of questions opened up for me. And I finally had the opportunity to ask why. Why do we learn this way? Why do we structure our system this way? And what kind of impact could we have on the system and on the world if we started to ask why? I'm gonna tell you a story. This handsome man behind me is my handsome, handsome father. And a few years ago, he had a doctor's appointment and he was told by his physician that he was gonna have to go on a low carb diet for a couple of weeks to prepare for a test that he was gonna have to take. The physician gave him a list of foods that he should avoid, included beets and raisins, stuff like that. A couple days later, I was talking to him on the phone and I said, how's your diet going? And I was shocked when he said, it's going fine. I'm not eating anything on the list, I'm good. And I was like, well, what are you eating? And he said, well, you know, I eat cassava and plantain and breadfruit. And some people are laughing probably because they're Caribbean. I will fill in everybody else. These are all carbs, <laughs> all of them. It is all carbs. This, I would argue, is an education problem. But it's not a patient education problem. It's a physician education problem. Imagine the type of training that would have taken a physician to go beyond their understanding of biomedical science and would help them understand instead social sciences, social systems, cultural differences. Imagine how that interaction with my father would have been very, very different. Imagine an education system that would have trained the physician not to think of the 185 pound white male as the standard patient an education system that prepares physicians to embrace variation as part of the routine would have produced a physician that knew my father needed a different list because 80-year-old Trinidadian men don't eat beets. <laughs> this is what I want to understand and solve. This is the medical problem I want to solve as an education scientist. I want to take everything I know about cognitive psychology to understand medical cognition. I want to understand how physicians learn, how they make decisions, how they reason, how they problem solve, and use that to train them to think and reason and problem solve differently so that they can have an impact on patient care. And I happen to believe fundamentally that education matters a lot. And it matters more now than ever before. Our healthcare system is changing rapidly. We've heard a lot about how it's changing today. Medicine is changing rapidly. Patients are expecting to walk into the doctor's office and be guided through a process and a system. Physicians are not the gatekeepers of all knowledge. Those patients walking in have a lot of knowledge coming in. And they're asking their physicians to help them understand the world not arbitrarily give them decisions. We need to change our education system to prepare future physicians to provide exceptional care in this changing landscape. In my lab right now, what we are realizing is that if we're gonna do this well, we have to fundamentally change many of the things that we always hold to be true about education. As a starting point, we started looking at their basic premise, the way we design health professions education. Right now, we spend a lot of time doing what we call a teach then test model. We deliver lectures, we deliver content to students, and then we let them show that they've learned it by taking tests, MCQs, whatnot. What we've seen in our experiments is that that teach then test is a great way to teach if you only want the physicians to understand what to do. If you want them to understand why they're doing it, you have to introduce struggle. You need to start off the bat by throwing the physician into an opportunity to solve a problem that they've never solved before, something you haven't actually taught them. And once they've struggled, 
and probably failed, then you teach. And what we've learned in the lab is that this form of teaching helps them understand why they're doing what they're doing. And when you understand why, you can remember the material better, you become a better diagnostician, and you are better prepared to continue learning in the future. What are we going to do with all this data and all these studies? We're going to change medical education. And once we've done with medical education, I'm going to work with my collaborators at Missioner and at TIER, and we are going to change education for perfusionists and chiropodists and surgeons and all of the other healthcare providers, because we need to make sure that they are prepared to provide the care that my father needs, the care that the system wants, and the care that all of our patients deserve. I have two gorgeous little boys who are over in the corner over here, and they're at the very start of their education journey. I have no idea what Preston and Christian are going to become down the line. I don't know where they're going to land. I can already see, though, that their world is so much bigger than mine ever was. And what I hope they learn from me and from all of you today that they had the, the wonderful opportunity to hear is that education matters and that they can never, ever, ever underestimate the powerful things that can happen when you ask why. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I think uh, your talk was probably the perfect ending to today because really what you're talking about is the future of medicine and of healthcare and the whole idea of collaboration. You know, that we heard from many different disciplines tonight, but in the future, all that will be mixed and we will no longer be siloed and everybody will be working with everyone else to find solutions to problems. So thank you for that. It was a great talk. Um, this was an amazing evening. Uh, actually, Andre, I was trying to think, I'm, I'm going to take the challenge of that sports analogy you made with the Leafs. I was trying to think, is there something in medicine that I can compare to the Toronto Maple Leafs? And the only thing I could come up with, and I, I really do like this though, um, it's the discovery of the Higgs boson particle. Because just as, you know, the Leafs is kind of like a religion with us, right? And people believe in it, and we really think they're going to win the cup someday. My understanding of the Higgs boson was that it was like 50 years it took for that discovery and mi millions if not, I think it was billions of dollars poured into the research. It was just an idea, but people believed in it. They believed and poured all that money and all that time and then it became true. But it, it could not have come true but still people believed in that dream. So I love that story. You know, to, to me, I find it very noble. And you know, it's, it's a dream that people chased. So maybe that'll give some of you some inspiration and maybe it'll also give some funders some inspiration to support these dreams. Um, I learned a lot tonight, I hope you did too. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we're going to have uh, some cocktails and some snacks and mingling and you can meet the scientists. Uh, but I would like to call all the presenters uh, to join Dr. Smith, Dr. Waters, Andre and myself on stage uh, at the end of this event, we'd like to take a group photo, but right now I'd like to call on Dr. Brad Waters, who's Executive Vice President of Science and Research at UHN, to make a few closing remarks. Well, um, what an inspiring evening. Uh, I want to start by thanking Mary for hosting tonight and, and to Andre for setting the stage and for making that uh, elegant thesis around the importance of scientific communication um, in thinking about how we're going to move forward in research. Um, but I also want to thank each of our scientists tonight, our seven scientists. I, I think you'll agree that they represent uh, the extent and diversity of our scientific talent at UHN. These are seven individuals that come from different parts of the world. You hear about the different kinds of questions that they're tackling, the different areas, the different areas of disease and health research going forward. Um, and they've come and tonight to present a little bit outside of their comfort zone. You know, uh, Winston Churchill was asked one time to give some remarks at an, an event, and he was asked how long he would need to prepare. 
And he said, well, if you'd like me to speak for five minutes, I'll need 24 hours. If you'd like me to speak for an hour, I can start right now. <laughs> and our scientists are a little bit the same way. Uh, we've asked them to speak three minutes tonight uh, to a different audience, and they've needed about a week to prepare. Um, but they've done a terrific job and, and a very inspiring uh, evening. And I want to thank them for the work that you're doing every day, the passion you bring, um, and the potential that you bring to all of the community. And it is a critical time. Um, you heard uh, the situation that uh, research is in very eloquently from Andre. Uh, we have a federal election coming up. We haven't heard a lot around the importance of moving the, the needle on health care, about the importance of research in driving it, about the place of Canada in, in the world on that zone. But you also see the potential tonight and the excitement and, and the success that is happening inside our environment in that potential. And so the theme of tonight is really about communication and, and scientific communication and the important role that's going to play going forward. Our voices are powerful together and I encourage you to use them to take what you hear tonight and to help amplify the conversation, to continue the communication to your neighbours, to your MPs, to your MPPs, um, and to everyone who plays a role in making decisions around where we want to move as a country. And so I'm going to leave you with this. If you're satisfied today with our current treatments that we have for disease, our pace of acceleration of, of, of movement on, in research and driving new ways for patients to access care, therapies that we have to offer, the kinds of toxicity associated with the therapies that we give, then we don't need to do too much more. But if you want new treatments, if you want new cures, if you want the applications of new technologies, if you want to see the pace of those continue, then we need your participation too. We need your support, we need your voice, and we need to continue this communication and dialogue together. So I'd like to just um, say one last thank you to the team at Kremble. Carly and team, please raise your hands. This was, this was their idea. They came one day to uh, one of our executive meetings and made uh, a three minute TED talk pitch <laughs> around the importance and the, and the opportunity to do this. And um, we're very excited. Uh, I wanna thank for all the work that they've done to put together what's been a, a marvelous evening. And I'd also like to say um, that if you want to learn more about the research going on, there's some annual reports and the kinds of things that we usually produce. But we've also, um, last week, launched a new podcast. Uh, Nikki's probably heard all of them already. Um, the podcast is called Behind the Breakthrough. Uh, you have a chance to hear about our science and about the scientists that participate in it and their stories too. So uh, the first one went out last week, uh, the second one came out today, it's a, a scientist here at the Kremble. I encourage you to go find that at, at all the places you, you find um, podcasts on, on the internet. So thanks for coming. Um, I encourage you to continue the dialogue outside with a drink and, and to meet our scientists um, and look forward to the next event like this. Thank you.